Welcome to Mormon Land, where we explore news in and about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'm senior religion reporter Peggy Fletcher Stack. Joining me is senior managing editor David Noyce, who oversees our faith coverage. Hi, Dave. Hello, Peggy. Before we start, we remind you about another way to support Mormon Land. Just go to patreon.com, where with a donation as small as $3 a month, you can access transcripts to our podcasts, our complete newsletter, and all of our exclusive religion coverage. Again, that's Patreon, E-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Mormon Land. Now for today's episode. Lots of national politicians are keen to learn how Mitt Romney may skewer them in McKay Coppin's newly released biography, Romney, A Reckoning. Coppins, who writes for The Atlantic, had access to the journals and emails, as well as candid interviews with the Republican Utah senator, who made history as the first Latter-day Saint to top a major party's pre presidential ticket and first senator to vote to remove a president of his own party. But because Romney and Coppins are both members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, there's also a lot of Mormon speak in the book. The writer explores the way in which Romney's faith became a political roadblock for him while at the same time providing him spiritual strength and comfort. Coppins joins us via Zoom from his home in Virginia to share ways Romney's beliefs shaped the man, how he faced the Mormon moment, why he lined up so boldly against Donald Trump, and what church leaders had to say about it all. McKay, welcome. Thanks for having me. Okay. When did you first met, meet Mitt Romney and what were your impressions of him? Ah, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I, you know, I actually grew up in Massachusetts. Um, in fact, in the same uh, Belmont suburb that Mitt Romney lived in for a few years when I was very young. So I may have met him as a, as a child, but don't remember it. Um, I really first uh, got to know him when he was running for president in 2012. I was assigned to cover his campaign um, and, uh, you know, basically chased him around the country for a year. It, what's interesting, though, is that I uh, that year got to know his stump speech very well, uh, you know, to the point where I was like dreaming about it. I had memorized every word. Um, I, uh, you know, had I wrote dozens, scores of stories about him. Um, but I never actually interviewed him one on one. And um, I later found out it was because his campaign consultants had basically made a decision that his religion was a political liability. They would rather not talk about it. And they were a little wary of this Mormon reporter lurking in the back of the campaign press bus. <laughs> and so. Uh, while he did give interviews to a number of reporters, they kind of kept me at arm's length. I don't know if Mitt Romney had anything to do with that decision, but his, his advisors kept me away. Um, so really, my first, you know, in-depth conversation with him didn't happen until he arrived in Washington in 2019 as a senator. That I met with him in his uh, first Senate office and we sat down and, and started to get to know each other. And it was interesting. One of the things I, I noticed right away is that he has this kind of televised quality about him in real life, right? Like he he almost feels like he's, uh, you know, uh, made to be on on a TV screen. Um, but when you sit down with him and you actually get to talk to him, you you realize very quickly that he he has a kind of puckish sense of humor. He can be irreverent. He is well attuned to the absurdities of political life and uh, more willing than many political leaders to kind of dish about uh, his experiences. And so I could tell right away he would make a fantastic subject, first of a profile that I wrote for The Atlantic and then later on uh, for, a, for a biography. Yeah. So how did you persuade uh, Romney to participate on the book? Yeah, it's it's funny. I don't think he would have if not for what happened on January 6th uh, mm. at the Capitol. I, I had profiled him, as I said, for the Atlantic and uh, and and throughout the presidential campaign in 2020 and throughout uh, the pandemic, I kind of kept in touch with him. But I didn't. Um, it, it was after January 6th that I could tell that he something had really shaken him about what happened at the Capitol. Um, 
he, you know, he told me that it, it, upon reflecting on that, it, it drove home to him that, you know, the American experiment is more fragile than many of us realize. And uh, the, the way he put it is that authoritarianism is like a gargoyle perching uh, at the top of the cathedral waiting to pounce. Mm -hmm. And he's he's he was worried after January 6th about um, whether whether that gargoyle would finally kind of invade the the inner sanctum of American democracy. And as a journalist and as a biographer, as an author, you know, having a subject who is kind of openly grappling with what his party has become, what is happening to his country and with his own career, including some of the mistakes that he's made. I mean, that that's kind of a dream subject, right? It is very rare. And I can say this having profiled many powerful people uh, in my career. It is very rare to get somebody um, who is willing to open up on the level that he did and be as transparent and candid as he was. And uh, when I pitched him on the idea of the book, uh, he he gave it some thought and and finally said, you know, I, I, I'm going to do this because, uh, for one thing, I, I had always thought that I was going to write a memoir and I decided that I wouldn't uh, because I can't be objective about my own life, uh, which is a, a kind of almost startling level of self-awareness. Um, <laughs> but then he also said that I want this story to be told and I want to be able to pass it down to my posterity, to my grandkids and great grandkids. Uh, and so he he opened up his life to me over the next two years. Wow. Would you have done the book even if he'd said no? Or do you, or I mean, it would have been a much different book. It would have been. And I mean, I think I would have probably tried to table it and then revisit it with him down the line. Um, you know, I there I've certainly done write arounds, they call them uh, it with profiles where you, you know, uh, write about subjects who don't cooperate, but you interview all the people who know them. And, you know, and there is something to be said for that. And I, I'm proud of some of the pieces I've written that, uh, that, that were written that way. But I think the real selling point to me for this project was his own candor. Um, in fact, I even said to him at the, in our first meeting, I said, I only want to do this if you're ready to be fully candid, right? Because, you know, he had been known throughout a lot of his political career as this sort of cautious, calculating, highly disciplined politician. And I understand the reasons that he was like that. I get into some of them in the book. But, you know, what I said is it's this 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 kind of book, the kind of book I'm envisioning doesn't work if you're going to approach it that way. Um, and to to my pleasant surprise, he basically reacted to that like it was a dare and immediately started uh you know giving me his journal <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah well I, I remember literally i was in church one day one sunday shortly after we began this project and i got a text from from mitt romney uh, that said hey mckay check your email um i just sent you something that might be useful before our next meeting and I looked and it was just hundreds of pages of his journals uh, typed out uh, in my inbox. I hadn't even asked for them. And that to me was just a sign that he was really approaching this in good faith and ready to to be uh, open in a way that he hadn't really been before with a journalist, but really that almost no sitting uh, office holders are. So you mentioned this a little bit, but at times... Mitt Romney comes off as kind of stiff and aloof in public. Do you think that had anything to do with his faith? It's a good, good question. I think that there is some part of him that, um, well, there's two things going on. One of them is his dad, right? Um, his dad it, it was, you know, the governor of Michigan, was seen as a rising star in the Republican Party in the 1960s. Actually, most people believed he would be the Republican nominee, um, uh, presidential nominee. And his campaign was sort of uh, derailed by this gaffe that he made during a, an interview about the Vietnam War, where he, he said he had changed his position on the Vietnam War uh, because he had been brainwashed by the the generals when he went over to Vietnam. Um, and that word, it, it, it wasn't so much the sentiment, but the the word itself brainwashed became kind of the obsession of the political press. Uh, nobody would let it go. Uh, Republican politicians started piling on and he was basically chased out of the race. 
Um, and Mitt Romney was on his mission at this point in France. And so he wasn't super plugged into the presidential campaign, but he was watching all this from afar. And the takeaway he had was my dad, uh, my dad's march to the White House was brought to an end because he was he, he was too honest. He was too kind of recklessly, uh, you know, candid. And so I think Mitt Romney um you know, defined a lot of his political career in, in contrast to that. Uh, he was always so careful. But Peggy, you you asked about his faith. I do think there's something to that. Like, I think that many of us uh, as Latter-day Saints are sort of um, we're we're keenly aware, especially those of us who grew up outside of Utah or outside of places where there are a lot of Mormons. You're keenly aware of how you represent your faith and how, you know, what people think of you when they're watching you. Um, that's actually something that he and I bonded over. I grew up in Massachusetts. He grew up in Michigan. Um, but I, I do wonder if part of the the stiffness was his kind of um, his his fear of, uh, you know, betraying something about himself that would make people think he was weird or aloof or different. Right. Um, what's interesting, though, is that I think in this later stage of his career, that same experience as a Latter-day Saint growing up outside of Utah has helped make him more comfortable with defying his party. Um, you know, something he told me was that uh, the growing up Mormon uh, outside of a place like Utah helps you get used to being different in ways that are important to you. And I think that uh, that's been a kind of defining theme of his career in these these last few years. What did he think, McKay, of the so-called Mormon moment? I think it was a uh, I think it was a <laughs> trying time for him um, in a lot of ways, you know, and it's funny because I experienced this Mormon moment sort of in parallel with him as a reporter who was covering his campaign as a as a Mormon myself. Who is honestly writing a lot of those Mormon moment stories. In fact, I was at Newsweek when uh, we ran that cover of Mitt Romney's head on a dancing Mormon missionary. And the 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 title of the story on the cover was the Mormon moment, uh, which his campaign didn't like very much. I, <laughs> I think that it was I think Mitt Romney struggled with it because on the one hand, he wanted to represent his faith well um, and he didn't want to embarrass the church. But he also didn't see that as his primary. He didn't see it as his primary responsibility to educate Americans on Mormonism. Right. He was trying to win a presidential election. And in some ways, winning a presidential election, especially a Republican primary in 2012, sort of ran counter to the project of educating Americans on Mormonism. Right. Like the, the more he would talk about his faith. Uh, the more alienated certain segments of the Republican Party and the secular left were. Um, and, you know, I went back and kind of dove back into the archives of coverage of both of his presidential campaigns. And I, I have to say, I was taken aback by how how uh, harsh a lot of the coverage was of his faith. Um, and it's not that, you know, I think religion coverage should be uh you know, vigorous and 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 intense and sometimes, uh, you know, critical be like any kind of journalism should be. Um, but it, it was more the cheap shots that often got taken at him there. You know, New York Times columnists making jokes about Mormon underwear, um, people asking about collab. You know, uh, I remember um, there was uh, one one case where, oh man, I'm trying to remember exactly what it was, but he he I, or I had to give an interview and uh, as a campaign reporter talking about the, the race and there <laughs> the whole interview ended up becoming about Kolob and what Mormons believe about Kolob. And the, the hosts were kind of snickering at it the whole time. And they wanted me to sort of like, you know, make Mitt Romney sound like a crazy person. Um and, 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 you know, I think a lot of that stuff is just something that you wouldn't see from people who consider themselves enlightened talking about other religious groups. But for some reason, Mormonism was just so unknown and so obscure to a lot of people that uh, they thought of it as fair game. Mitt Romney tried to navigate that best he could. He did answer questions when he was asked. 
at his convention when once he won the nomination, he he kind of came out as a Mormon a little bit more. He had several, uh, you know, people who knew him as a bishop and stake president in Boston uh, speak at the convention. He had I remember one person actually gave a Mormon prayer at the convention one day, which was a big deal. And so, you know, he had these moments. But for the most part, I think he was really conflicted because he just he he felt like his responsibility as the nominee of a major party was to try to win the White House. And he couldn't also be, you know, a seminary teacher in chief for the country. Mm-hmm. So, so let me just ask you, does does he use the term Mormon when he talks? He does. In fact, I have a note. I have a note in, in at the end of the book about this because I had to make a decision early on about whether I was going to use the term Mormon and Mormonism throughout the book. And I basically decided to use it because Mitt Romney uses it. And and it, like, it, you know, he really has not made the <laughs> he has not made the pivot to uh, to using, you know, the full name of the church every time he mentions it. So uh, he, he does use it. Um you know, we actually had a conversation about this at one point, and he said, I'm all for the project of trying to associate our faith more with Jesus Christ, but I'm not sure, you know, abandoning Mormon and using Latter day Saint does that because neither of those terms has Jesus's name in it. Right. Mm-hmm. And so he, he, uh, he, he's, he continues to use the term. Oh, so. What kind of relationship did he have with the church's first presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles? Did did he seek their endorsement? Did he report back to them after his after he after he lost his election? What you know? I mean, not that they didn't know, but he, yeah. Well, so he certainly didn't uh, seek their endorsement when he was running, but after the campaign, um, he was invited to kind of meet with the first presidency and quorum of the 12 apostles and sort of debrief like this is you know what i learned on the presidential campaign trail and my understanding is that the church does this from time to time where Mm. uh church leaders will meet with prominent members in various industries or or sectors and just kind of get informational briefings and um it was interesting. I think it was actually Ann Romney who told me that in one of those first meetings after uh, his presidential campaign, um, they met with President Packer and President Packer offered to give him a blessing um, uh, at the end of their meeting. And in the blessing, uh, President Packer said more than once that uh, this is just the beginning for you. This is just the beginning. And when the blessing was over, he told Mitt Romney, I, I got the distinct impression that you're not done with politics. And uh, and Ann Romney said, well, you must not know very much about politics. And President Packer said, well, maybe you don't know very much about prophecy, uh, which was kind of a, a stark, <laughs> uh, a stark comment from a leader of their faith. But that th- those words, this is just the beginning, um, were ringing in Romney's ears for the next few years after his campaign, because he even as he tried to kind of uh, settle into quasi retirement, he he had this nagging feeling that there was still something he should be doing, and he wasn't sure what it was. And he he got his answer in 2016 with with the rise of Donald Trump. So did he think of himself as chosen by God to lead the country? Did he feel yeah. like a, a divine mission? You know what's interesting about this? I I asked him about this a couple times, but where he was most candid about that question was in his journals. And in his journals, he kept very detailed journals throughout 2012 uh, during the presidential campaign. And I think it began as sort of an exercise in just documenting his day to day life for eventual presidential memoirs if he won. Uh, But then then it kind of became over time a venting exercise for him. It would often at the end of a hard day, he would, you know, settle in with his iPad and just tap out his like withering views of Rick Perry or Newt Gingrich or whatever. <laughs> but it's interesting. He he reflects several times in his journals on this idea of him, you know, whether he's being chosen. And he actually totally rejects that idea. He, he, he said that um, there was one point when, um, It was a Pat Robertson, the, uh, you know, evangelical televangelist actually called him and said uh, that he had been at his cabin praying and that God had told him that Mitt Romney was going to be the next president. And 
Romney sort of politely demurred and then wrote in his journal, I haven't gotten any revelations or impressions like that. <laughs> um, in fact, there's one moment where he he writes an entire journal entry in the style of a fake news article poking fun at the uh, other Republican candidates for president who have said that they've been called by God to run for president. Uh, Cause he finds that he, he found that idea kind of absurd. He, he said, he said uh, that he didn't feel called by God to run for president. He was called by Ann Romney, his wife to run. Um, <laughs> but he, he, it's interesting. Like, I think, you know, he would often have um, members of the church come up to him when he was running for president and mention the white horse prophecy and say, you know, you're going to be the fulfillment of this. And he would always push back against it uh, because he, he he fundamentally doesn't, I think, believe that God very often intervenes in things like presidential elections. Um and he th he also thinks that it's dangerous for any political figure to see themselves as called by God to hold some position of power because, uh, you know, you end up justifying a lot of really bad things to get there if you think that it's kind of a manifest destiny. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I think in that way, he he did he did wrestle with it a lot. And, and we did talk about this thing. He said, ultimately. Uh, you know, he considers it one of life's great imponderables, how often God intervenes in the affairs of man. And he doesn't claim to have the answer to that. I, I'm going to ask you a question, McKay, you may not be able to answer, but do you think he would have been a good president? It's a good question. I think actually, yes. And, uh, you know, I don't I mean, set aside the policies of, you know, tax reform or, you know, the size of government. Um, I think that those the, the things he would have done as president would have come down to your political beliefs, right? What, what how, how big should the federal government be? How big should the social safety net be? Um, there are probably some things he would have done that I would have disagreed with. I think, though, at his heart, he's a pragmatic technocrat. And we didn't realize it at the time in 2012, but we were heading into a time when a competent technocrat would have actually been very helpful in the White House. Um I think you could make the case that Obama uh, did fine in his second term. But if Romney had won in 2012 and then gotten reelected in 2016, we would have been spared the Trump presidency. Mm -hmm. And then we would have had Mitt Romney in office when the pandemic began. And I, I have to say, I think Mitt Romney was kind of built in a lab to handle a crisis like the pandemic. I think that um, he listens to experts. He takes their advice seriously. He digs into the data and. Uh, and really tries to understand, um, you know, the 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 best approaches to to address, you know, emergencies. And I think he would have done well in uh, in a situation like that. But actually, can I can I counter with a question of my own? Because I often ask I'll just say you don't have to answer, but I'll just say I often ask Democrats if they would trade Obama's second term if it meant that there was no Trump presidency, right? <laughs> because mm -hmm. if Romney had won in 2012, Trump probably wouldn't have run in 2016. And I think over the years, um, Demo more and more Democrats have told me, oh, yeah, I would have much rather had a, a Romney presidency and uh, then, you know, a, 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 then had to deal with the last, you know, eight years of Trump looming large over American politics. Yeah, I, I won't I won't answer personally, but I will say I've heard those discussions, too. And and more and more, uh, even now, as as Donald Trump runs again, of course. So. Mm -hmm. So, McKay, how difficult was it? for Mitt to vote to remove Trump from office? And how did he feel after he did it? He he really agonized over it. Um, his journals from that period show a man who is wrestling with his conscience, right? On the one hand, it's kind of a tug of war between political expediency and what he believes to be right. And you know, he went through the Senate trial um, as one of really the only Republican senators who even expressed any openness to voting to convict. You know, almost his entire caucus said right from the outset, we think this trial is a sham. We don't see ourselves as jurors. We are supporters of the president and we're going to do everything we can to make sure he's not convicted. And, you know, Mitt Romney in, saw his role differently. He said, 
I took an oath to be an impartial juror to set aside par- set aside partisan passions and prejudices. And I'm going to look at the evidence as it comes and try to uh, make my decision based on the best of my abilities. And I can attest from having read his journals that he really did struggle with it. Um, you know, there were some days where he would write through the evidence that he had seen that day and and say, I think I'm leaning toward acquittal. And then the next day he'd say, well, but, you know, the, uh, the good argument was made to me and now I'm leaning toward conviction. Uh, there was one moment toward the end of the trial where he had all but made up his mind to vote to acquit along with the rest of the Republicans. He just thought, you know, there's at least a plausible defense that Trump, uh, you know, was being stupid on that call with Volodymyr Zelensky, but that he, you know, didn't do something necessarily that rises to the level of high crimes and misdemeanors. Um, but when he then told his wife, Anne, that he was leaning toward acquittal, she she responded that she was surprised. She didn't, you know, render any judgment. She didn't expound. She just said she was surprised by that. And then reading his journals, he immediately went back to the drawing board because Ultimately, Mitt Romney has spent his entire life basically trying to win and keep the respect and approval of his wife. Uh, He really cares about that. And so when he sensed that she disapproved, he kind of went back and and considered it again. The, you know, the the final uh, the final decision was actually a prayerful one. He um, you know, he had gone over the gone through the Q&A session with the lawyers for both the defense and the prosecution um, and went back to his office and uh, went through some of his uh, his his notes and finally knelt down and prayed. And the he he later told me that the hymn that kept coming to mind was, um, you know, do what is right. Let the consequence follow. And uh, he he ultimately decided, even though he knew there would be enormous blowback for him in Utah and uh, in Washington, that Republicans uh, he probably would lose friendships that the conservative media would hate him. And basically all that, th- all, all of that stuff came true. He decided it was the right thing to do. And, and that he didn't, he, he had reached a point in his life and career where he didn't want to make, to rationalize doing the politically expedient thing anymore. Um, and, and so he did the right thing, but it was not an easy decision for him. Was he aware that he was going to make history by being the first to, vote to remove a president from his own party. Was he aware of that? It's a really good question. I, I it, So he knew he would be probably the only Republican in this case to vote to convict. But yeah, it, reading his journal, it seems that he didn't realize that hmm. until after he took the vote uh, because he got a he got a text from uh, I can't remember one of his sons who who said, uh, hey, an interesting historical note here. You're the first senator in history to vote to convict a president of your own party. And he wrote that into his journal after he had already mm. taken the vote. So I, I don't think he knew that he was going to be making history in that way. But he did, see, you know, he did see this as a legacy defining moment. Right. Mm. Um, and not just for him, but also for his dad. And it's funny, so much of his decision, his decisions and uh, the things that he's done in the last few years come back to him wanting to live up to his dad's legacy as kind of a principled uh, Republican. And uh, I think that he he felt like this was an opportunity to do well by his his father's name. Yeah. Just before he ran for Senate, you know, that that a senior apostle M. Russell Ballard asked Romney if he would head up an LDS version sort of of the Jewish anti-defamation league. Why did Ballard want that and why didn't Romney do it? I mean, I can't speak to why Elder Ballard wants it. Uh, all I know is that he asked Mitt to look into it. Mm-hmm. Um, I can say that the reason Romney ultimately decided against it was that he didn't feel that the greatest threats to the church were coming from outside. He he felt like uh, he, he actually, you know, writes about this, I believe, in one of his emails um, uh, that, that or maybe it was his journal, I can't remember, but he he says, you know, uh, I, I studied it, I took it seriously, I reflected on this, but ultimately I think that the biggest problem for the church is young people growing disillusioned, losing their faith and leaving. And I don't think having some kind of church entity pushing back against negative media coverage or whatever will do anything to help those young people stay in the church. And 
and, and that that is the way he's thinking about the issue. He does care a lot about the church and he cares a lot about his faith, uh, but he doesn't see uh, he, he per, perhaps he doesn't see the challenges to the church the same as uh, some other you know church leaders or prominent members. After two years of working closely with Mitt on the book, did you find yourself liking him, admiring him? If so, what did you like best and what did you think were his weaknesses? You know, I, I really did like him. I mean, I will say I have spent the last several years writing these long magazine profiles about, you know, prominent political figures. And sometimes you get stuck with an assignment to profile someone that you really don't end up liking. And it, and I will say that in almost every case, I can find something that I like about my subject or something that I find interesting or compelling about them. Right. I, I'm not a especially judgmental person, and I don't think of myself as somebody who's hard to get along with. But um, I was really fortunate that in the case of Mitt Romney, I found I liked spending time with him. I, li- I, I thought he was uh, he was, you know, clearly a smart guy, insightful. Um and and more humble than I would have expected. I also have to say that we spent a lot of time together at his house um, in D.C. He doesn't have a lot of friends out here and, in fact, has lost friends uh, over the years as this kind of Republican dissident. And so often that he would block off some time for me to come interview him uh, at night and I would be done with my questions. And then he would say, so have you ever seen Better Call Saul or, you know, uh, what's uh, what's what are you reading lately? And he just kind of wanted to, like, talk. I think he enjoyed the company um, and I, I enjoyed it, too. It, it's funny. There were, you know, I have four young kids now. I had three when I was uh, writing the book. And uh, sometimes I would end up missing bedtime because I, I was, you know, wa- working on this and I would come home and. The next morning, the kids would be like, let me guess, you were with Mitt Romney again. What, did, he keep, <laughs> did he keep you late? <laughs> what, watching Ted Lasso or something? He, lo- he loves Ted Lasso, <laughs> okay. Better Call Saul, uh, uh, Game of Thrones. He's a big fan. He's actually quite the uh, prestige TV connoisseur. Um, <laughs> but no, I mean, yeah, I do. I, like, I, I also really, uh, I enjoyed his, um, his, his sense of humor. Like he, he really is. He can be very funny on the subject of how absurd certain elements of our politics are and uh, and see, getting some of those stories from somebody on the inside is, you know, it's it's undeniably fun. Um, but, it, you know, in terms of what his greatest virtues are, I, I'll go back to the humility. You know, this is a guy who has no reason to have humbled himself at this stage of his life and, you know, made this kind of a, attempt at you know, political repentance or or redemption. Um, You know, he's, he's extremely wealthy. He has a beautiful family who loves him. Um, He could have easily settled into kind of an elder statesman role in the Republican party and sort of uh, stayed below the radar during the Trump years, but he felt this inclination to rush toward the emergency and roll up his sleeves and do what he can. I think there's a kind of something very Mormon about that, frankly. And, um, and I, I admire that, but I also admire that he was willing to reflect on times in his life when he, um, he crossed ethical lines or he compromised on his principles or sacrificed, uh, those, those principles at the altar of ambition he, the fact that he not only acknowledges the, that now, but is willing to talk about it with me, I think uh, speaks very well of his character and uh, very well of him. And it, it's one of the things that I hope uh, people take away from this book, that not just when it comes to Mitt Romney, but that that we hold our political leaders to a higher standard because it is possible for them to look beyond their next election cycle. So any weaknesses? Uh, you do note in the book, he's got a little bit of an anger issue. Oh, sure. He, he's he got a temper. He can be judgmental. Um, <laughs> there were times when he he uh, would say things about some of his fellow Republicans that I, even I was sort of taken aback by how judgmental they were and uh, and thought that, you know, maybe a little harsh. Uh, you mentioned his anger. Um, 
you know, several times uh, throughout his career, talking to people who have worked with him, they would mention times when he just lost his lost his temper. And uh, during a mock debate, for example, he would throw his notes on the floor and storm off. And, um, you know, he I think it's rooted in um, he has an almost kind of uh, like aristocratic conviction in decorum and propriety and when he feels that people are not living up to his standards he very quickly can lose his temper on them um and so that yeah there are a lot of weaknesses i think also you know and this is something he owns up to he has at various times in his career had a tendency to rationalize things that are in his self-interest to basically convince himself that what's easy is also the right thing to do it's be i think the reason he's so good at, he has been so good at that or capable at that at, at times in his life is first of all because he has a, a very facile mind you know he has a he's a he has a quick mind he's very analytical he can see things from a lot of different angles he has a very clamorous conscience that's constantly uh you know eating at him and so to to kind of put his conscience at peace he will find new ways to think about issues that sometimes aren't you know uh, him being quite honest with himself. And so, uh, you know, he has weaknesses like everybody else, though. Again, I will just say, I think that as a subject, what made him compelling is that he was willing to grapple with those weaknesses in a way that very few people at his level of politics or American life are willing to do. So what do you think his legacy will be? I know he cared a lot, cares, cared a lot about that, at least. In- yeah. I mean, <sighs> I think that within Mormonism, he will be remembered as, you know, the first the the Mormon Al Smith, the first major party presidential nominee. Um, And I think he'll be remembered for this latter period of his career where he pushed back against elements of his own party when it was an enormous political sacrifice for him. Um, I don't think that the Trump era will be remembered kindly by history. Um, And I think those few people who were willing to follow their conscience and do what they believed was right in the face of enormous pressure not to will be remembered well. And I think Romney will be among those. The name of the book, again, is Romney, A Reckoning. McKay Coppins, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. And thanks to Dave Noyce. Always a pleasure. And to our producer, Chris Samuels, we remind our readers they can keep up on all the happenings in and about the church by subscribing to the Salt Lake Tribune's free Mormon land newsletter. Just go to sltrib.com to sign up and we'll talk again next time on Mormon land. Mormon land.